Hello and welcome. You're listening to the American Interest Podcast with me, Richard Aldous. My guest this week is Christina Spohr, Professor of History at the Kissinger Centre in Washington and at the London School of Economics, and author of the new book, Post Wall, Post Square, Rebuilding the World After 1989. Uh, Christina, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much. So congratulations on the new book. Uh, so what are the square and the wall of the title? The wall is the Berlin Wall and the world that emerged post-wall. And the square is Tiananmen Square, considering what happened in 1989 uh, in China, in the capital of China. And your basic argument is that we can't understand the one without the other and the world which emerges after the Cold War. Absolutely, because I'm trying to explain that rather than there being just one story of the end of the Cold War and giving us closure, what we are really seeing is a dual exit from the Cold War. There was the one exit that had to do with the post-war world, um, you know, the freedom in Europe that Eastern Europeans achieved, the, the, the wall disappearing and the permeability, people on the move, electoral revolution, the fall of communism, the disappearance of the Soviet Union. But it wasn't just a story that is often also linked um, to this argument of the end of history, this universalization of democratic values, that it was all about um, especially American values that kind of had won out. There was a second exit from the Cold War, which was the Chinese one. Um, under Deng Xiaoping, um, the Chinese had cracked down on the protests uh, in Tiananmen Square, and this Maoist insular country that had undertaken some uh, economic opening to the world markets and opening to free markets um, was, however, cracking down on any kind of demands for political freedom. And that is um, a path where China really uh, began its ascent and following its own compass after these events in Tiananmen Square. And I would very much um, like to link that to the statement that Deng Xiaoping made in 1989 when he said that he doesn't really care what others think about us. The only thing we really care about is a good environment for developing ourselves. And so long as history eventually proves the superiority of the Chinese socialist system, that's enough. He wasn't looking for you know, China's ascent in terms of world leadership or so, but he wanted to hold on to the Chinese model as a separate model and that China would start its own ascendancy in this new post-Cold War world on its own terms. That's quite interesting because at, at one point you quote uh, George H.W. Bush, uh, the first President Bush, and, and, and he says that uh, we can either define the times or let the times define us and shape as they will at a price uh, frightening to contemplate. Um, I mean, is that ultimately what happens, that the West got defined by the times, but as you say there, China defined their own times? I think the West defined its own times in different kinds of ways, but it wasn't, um, it doesn't fit with that, um, outright narrative of American victory. What I try to say with that Bush statement, and I think what um, Bush tried to, um, highlight is that the leaders mattered. The Chinese, of course, took their own path, but ultimately all of these ma leaders mattered in terms of trying to shape what was going on. So what I'm trying to explain is that of course, we had particular systemic changes that were occurring that, you know, even the intelligence reports of the 1980s um, were talking about, namely that we could see here in the West that in the Eastern Bloc and in the Soviet Union, um, the, the plan, the socialist system, the planned economy um, was in deep structural problems, was failing, too much money was spent on the military industrial complex. And we could see that Gorbachev through his perestroika policy but also Deng Xiaoping through his policy in China of trying to um, bring in markets um, was, was shifting gear. However, nobody expected that those kinds of internal changes would bring about the end of the bipolar world, the system, the frozen system under which people were living. And what is very interesting is that, you know, um, it's in part through Gorbachev taking away the fear of the time. Gorbachev announcing several times, but in particular in 1988 at the UN, that um, the Soviet Union will not use force and that Gorbachev was really promoting 
you know, the sort of separate socialist path for the different Eastern European states because the Soviet Union was trying to sort of disinvest. It had, you know, was suffering from imperial overstretch and he was encouraging uh, individual national reforms. He was hoping that everybody would choose some kind of reformed, rejuvenated, modern socialism that would um, a kind of democratic socialism or socialist democracy, as he also um, liked to call it. And he had sort of an idea of Sweden in his mind, but obviously to turn the Soviet Union into, into a state like Sweden is sort of misunderstanding really what's going on. Um, but the point is that um, there was really the sort of drive for liberalization. And then, of course, the story, as it's been told, mostly is a story of revolution. When we think about 1989 in Eastern Europe, we always think about revolution, people power, people in the street, um, transnational, big migratory shifts, um, permeability of borders, and then, of course, also um, electoral revolutions where people, you know, who had previously protested, they get into power and they choose something else. They choose Western-style democratic kind of governance structures. Uh, and they want to get out of that Soviet shadow and they want to take their own path. And Gorbachev lets this happen. So in that sense, also Gorbachev is a really important figure. He wanted to reinvent communism, but in the process, actually, he basically destroyed the Soviet hold in Eastern Europe and, you know, in, in the bigger scheme of things, of course, he destroyed the Soviet Union uh, himself. Yeah, that's, I mean, that, that's the interesting thing, isn't it? I mean, Gorbachev is a, is a tricky one for historians because he, get, he very often gets lauded. He gets a lot of credit for uh, bringing the Cold War to an end. I notice um, uh, that Archie Brown in a, in a, a recent, uh, in a new book, is, is uh, kind of uh, banging that drum again. Uh, and yet he loses the entire Soviet empire. Um, I mean, is, is is he not a complete strategic failure in the sense that everything that he sets out to achieve actually ends in ashes? Well, the irony, of course, is that we must not forget that Gorbachev won the Peace Nobel Prize. And the bigger story, of course, is, first of all, you know, how did we exit the Cold War? What is wholly unprecedented in history, and if you look at also, you know, European history, whether it's 1648 or 1815 or 1918 or 1945, the big topographical changes um, have always occurred after wars. What is really striking is that this era of the Cold War, which, you know, was tied up with the bipolar global system, comes to an end peacefully. So the leaders do matter. And Gorbachev plays a big part that this was possible. And, um, you know, this, this, this whole sort of peaceful transformation, this, of course, the tragedy for him is that as part of that peaceful transformation, his own empire, if you so wish, um, collapses. This was, of course, not something that he set out to do. Gorbachev wanted the Soviet Union as a rejuvenated reform state to be competitive in a more peaceful world. That's why, of course, he was also pushing for the diffusing of the Cold War in the military arms race so that he could invest more time and money in his um, domestic reform policy. But for the global system at large, that particular diffusing um, of the nuclear arms race, which everybody feared, incidentally, that, of course, there would be nuclear Armageddon. I mean, people worried that the Cold War will come to an end through a big bang. And that was still even what you know, a NATO exercise in the winter of 1989 was practicing and was imagining. That was, you know, the war games um, script, if you so want. And then if you look what really happened, this is not what happened. It's entirely different. And it has to do with these leaders who together through very, very tough negotiations that each side is still trying to push also their own national interests, try to find solutions um, to manage a process. That's why I call the leaders in my book the managers of the exit from the Cold War. Yeah, do you, you put quite a heavy emphasis on this kind of sense uh, almost of managerialism. Uh, you also describe them uh, as undertaking a conservative diplomacy. Um, what do you mean by that? And isn't managerialism actually one of the things that they get criticised for because they they do manage things, but there isn't a vision which accompanies that. Yeah, so the interesting thing is, I, yes, I do call them the managers, but of course these managers, what is interesting in that generation is, they are all people who have experiences or memories, at least, of World War II. And so they are absolutely um, convinced that the most important thing is 
to keep the peace. Because, you know, it's also frightening when you have thousands and thousands of people protesting and crossing borders and all the realities um, are sort of falling apart that you have known. So what you need to manage is you need to channel these forces. That's where leadership and governance comes in. And there is a lot of questions around, you know, what kind of visions did they have? As I already highlighted, Gorbachev wanted to reinvent communism. That was his vision, but he had no clear strategies how to do this. And, you know, it all sort of fell apart. Um, and Bush got criticized for being a man. You know, he hasn't really a vision, so he doesn't really know where it is going. But, you know, he also had particular premises. And what is interesting is that whether you look at Bush or Gorbachev or Helmut Kohl, when they really start to negotiate, they actually consciously talk about themselves as, you know, shapers of grabbing the mantle of history that a lot of responsibility lies on them, lies on them, and that they're really trying to sort of get ahead of the curve, if you do want, that, that they really get to a point where they can channel the forces. So if you look, for example, at the story of German unification, well, that that issue as an international issue comes on the agenda after the wall has been opened and the pressure from the East German citizens wanting to get to the West, wanting to have reform first inside their state. But then once the boundary isn't there anymore um, and people keep pouring and voting by their feet into West Germany, um, then there is the question of how do you manage this process of the division of two states? How do you make it one? That's where the question is, who are the people who are coming up with ideas? And that's where the vision thing comes back. They are then trying to shape. They are then trying to imagine where they're going to go. And why do I call them conservative managers? Because I think what comes out of the choices that they make is that they um, act on a basis of first preserving structures that have been deemed to function well. So as we see that in the Eastern Europe, um, you know, people are opting out of the Warsaw Pact, that, that communism uh, is failing, that the plant economy has failed, that they're trying to embrace free markets, um, Western-style democracy, um, they have elections. Um, there is a sense, okay, these are all elements that have functioned in the Western system. Which are the institutions that have functioned well? What are the institutions that will help us with taking the neighbor sphere away of a potentially unified, bigger, sovereign, united Germany? The whole point is that West Germany, although it was an economic world power, people thought it is safe looking at Germany because that Germany is anchored in the so-called Western institutions. So the idea was a unified Germany will be safer, seeing that the East Germans all want to get that West German-style government. First of all, Helmut Kohl puts forward the idea, okay, there's a possibility that East Germany effectively, once they've had um, their first three elections, and let's see what government emerges. What emerges is that the, par the sister party of its own party wins. And so the option of having a monetary union in Germany along the Deutschmark, the West German mark, um, and the West German state structure, basically West Germany will absorb East Germany, that that creates the most predictability and stability on the European continent to do it that way. It's also the fastest way, and from the German perspective, something they can up to a point do on their own without the Victor Powers involvement. But then it's about building security in Europe. And what does that mean for then this Germany that's uniting in the heart of Europe? The, 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 the Germany that such a fear, it would be the Fourth Reich and going off on one and doing its own things and wanting all its territories in the East back, right? She talked about, you know, the Teutonic Chancellor, the sausage munching big German guy who just, you know, he's unpacked the map and said he wants Silesia and Pomerania and East Prussia and all these things. That's what she said in these public um, uh, summits uh, of, of even the European community. And she discussed this with Mitterrand, and she discussed this with um, Gorbachev, and she wanted to thwart German unification. But Kohl also knew that the French are always neuralgic about Germany. So the best way forward was to find a way that Germany would be unified inside the European community that was itself in a process of becoming a tighter so-called European Union, as we have it now, um, where the Deutsche Mark is also bound into a Eurozone, into an economic union. And that that would take all the neighbors' fears away. Because Helmut Kohl said, the trouble for Germany is its geography, and Germany cannot flourish if it doesn't make sure that it's at peace with all its neighbors. And that European solution actually calmed Mitterrand down. 
And then when you think about security, for the Americans, it was important that also the Soviets are not worried about the Germans. And eventually Gorbachev bought into the idea that perhaps that Germany is safest if it chooses its own alliance, fully knowing that that united Germany a la West German style will choose to remain a NATO member. That also meant that America will stay a European power because America through NATO is tied to Europe. And through that, again, Germany is tied into an alliance. It cannot just move on its own. So you can see that something that had worked for West Germany alone in the Cold War context that had made people feel at peace with that German problem was used as a solution that they imagined would work for the German question as a resolution. I, I, I suppose the big, uh, the big challenge that they then face is what to do with Russia. And, you know, I just, I wonder whether you think that some kind of post NATO, post European security architecture, um, that the Russians claimed that they wanted, was that actually possible? I mean, should Germany, the United States, should they have hugged Russia tighter, do you think? Or do you think that the institutions that they built up, do you think that they should have anticipated that Russia was always going to be this neurotic, insecure, great power, as it always had been historically? I think we must not forget, we must really put ourselves in the shoes of the leaders at the time. And we must really see that there had been significant trust built that, you know, it was a win-win situation for everybody. And for Gorbachev to have a sense that if Germany is bound in NATO and Germany will pay for the Red Army withdrawal from of Soviet, from Soviet military from East Germany and will build the barracks in the Soviet Union, will do special economic use. In the end, this whole process uh, over four years cost 100 billion Deutschmarks. Yeah, that is, if you so want, a sort of price tag. But it wasn't just about money. It was also about a real trust between um, Kohl and Gorbachev that German-Soviet relations have really moved beyond the Second World War. And why do I say that? I say that because, for example, the Japanese were trying to buy the Kuril Islands back from the Soviets and just offered money, and there was no diplomatic um, sort of engagement in a warm kind of way. There was no male friendship. Um, there was none of that paraphernalia around diplomacy that's so important to establish um, real trust and an improved relationship. The Germans really managed that well. But we must not forget that, you know, this was a time we also had the CSCE, and the CSCE was being touted as an organization that, or touted as a club that should be turned into an organization to um, create a pan-European structure and be a pan-European structure in Europe. And they had an important summit in Paris in 1990. But it becomes clear over the breakup of Yugoslavia that the CSCE, or later named OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, cannot act as a hard security organization. It hasn't got the capability. Also, the EU does not turn out to be a proper foreign policy and, and military structure, that it is NATO and the American power that will come into play. Now, coming back to, to the Soviet problem, we must remember that uh, in 1990, around the time when Germany was uniting formally, America, together with the Soviets and others on the UN Security Council, come together and they decide that they will be pushing Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait that Iraq had invaded. So that's really an East-West honeymoon, a Soviet-American honeymoon. And Bush's um, dream of what he calls the New World Order is a world order based on two pillars, of cooperation between the Soviet Union and America, even if in terms of real military power projection, America is sort of the stronger one at this stage, if you so want. But that's really important. Both sides buy into this over this Iraq war. But what Bush did not foresee and that what Bush hangs on until the very end is always Gorbachev. Even when changes begin to occur in the Soviet Union, when um, Gorbachev is being challenged by Yeltsin, when Gorbachev shifts to the hardliners and start to reject the reform path, then Shivat Nazi, the foreign minister of the Soviet Union, resigns over Gorbachev, turns to the hardliners. When the coup happens, until the very end, all the Western leaders cling on to Gorbachev. And then, boom, at the end of 1991, the Soviet Union is gone. That world order idea with the two pillars is gone. We have to all rethink. And 
the and Bush turns to Yeltsin, and that relationship starts on really well. And what I really want to highlight also is that it's Russia and Yeltsin who talks about turning Russia into a Western-style democracy, wanting Russia to be an ally of the United States, um, not just a partner, but also really an ally, is even considering of you know how Russia could be tied into NATO. So that's one side of the rhetoric, which lasts throughout 1992. But then it begins to change towards the end of that year, where Yeltsin starts to look more inward, where Yeltsin isn't so sure about the rule of law inside his own country. Shock therapy isn't working. He wants to hold on to political power. He starts looking to China. That Janus faced identity problem for what is now a Russian rump state, a smaller Russia than what the Soviet Union was given that everybody else has separated. That is beginning to think, what is it actually to be when it is Russia? What is its place in Europe? And the little countries in the middle between Russia and Germany, the former Eastern European satellite states, they are all thinking Russia is, uh, you know, an exporter of instability. Who knows what is going to happen with the nuclear weapons that are also spread around some of the other Soviet socialist former republics? They want to join EU and NATO. And that is where the tension you see start to appear because Russia doesn't want to let them really go. One, one of the things that uh, I actually find really interesting kind of reading the book is that when we read that story, uh, so many counterfactuals present themselves to us. That there are so many different paths. And of course, that contrasts so strongly with the other side of the story, uh, which you're telling, where, uh, which is about China, where counterfactuals seem much less appealing because, as you explain in the book, China effectively sets its own course and with such determination early on that those counterfactuals really just fizzle out uh, almost as soon as you try to uh, almost as, as soon as you try to make them fly. Um, so, you know, I wonder, I mean, do you think that the Western mistakes with China are made here or are they made later on? And do you agree with this kind of sense that China's own sense of determination and strategic um, certainty means that it's a very different story to that other half that you're telling? I think China really goes on its own path. And you must not forget that after Tiananmen, of course, the West had, um, you know, put the sanctions on China and only America was really sort of keeping the back channel open. You know, the West was really going on about the human rights and China sort of disappears from people's minds. It's not yet in the World Trade Organization. It's not yet really become capitalist. It's still, you know, shifting out of being a developing state, if you so want, into becoming a first rate ascending power. The ambition in China is there, but it's sort of very closed off. It's still insular at that point. Deeply nationalist insular, also, you know, moving out of this um, Maoism. And the 1990s are important because everybody's actually focused either on renegade states, whether it's North Korea, whether it's Iraq, whether it's other places, and this issue of, you know, what's happening in the post-Soviet um, area. And Americans themselves are very much driven um, by the sort of sense that they want um, that it's a unipolar moment that America is the sole big power projecting um, military might. Um, we still talk about an, a norm-based uh, world at that point, and we, we hope that the, there was hope in the West that the UN would become a more powerful tool. But you see, this all begins to unravel um, over the Balkans war because this is in the backyard of Europe. That's where you know all the hopes were for a better world. And, and in fact, you know, we end up in this quagmire, we see genocide, we see the you are not functioning really, we see this necessity, this belief that, you know, NATO has to act out of area, the Americans have to be brought back in, um, Britain, France, Germany, they can't agree how they should uh, act there. Um, the EU is, remains a civilian power, if you so want. Um, it doesn't become the big political player, yeah. The CSCE doesn't function. That would be the one organization where Russia is part. Yeah, and Russia is also grappling with itself, but um, we are much more focused on, you know, how can we bind Russia in the G7, uh, make a Russia-NATO joint council. There's still that big optimism. Yeah, I, th I think there have been some, some people have said that actually those Balkan wars that you're describing there, maybe actually they are a better guide to the post-war uh, post order in Europe than anything that the architects of that new order uh, thought they were building. That 
you know, particularly in Europe now, when we look at the various nationalist reactionary regimes across the the continent, that that would actually seem to be the 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 real direction of travel from the 1990s. But of course, the trouble was that the leaders I mentioned they all looked at this first of all under the uh, in the light of self-determination. Everything about the end of the Cold War is let's give people self-determination. Let's Let's have them, you know, vote for the governments they want. Let's 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 help the Baltic republics by the time you know they really press for independence. Let's support that. And of course, over Yugoslavia, that tension comes visible. Do nations uh, and the strong nations do they support territorial integrity and the sovereignty of the state in this case Yugoslavia, or do they support self-determination? The West German or the German government um, pushes for supporting self-determination and everybody else says the Germans are off on one and they're doing their own thing and that's the wrong thing to do. That's going to make it much worse. Uh, whereas Genscher thought, um, German Foreign Minister Genscher thought, actually, you know, it will maybe quell this, this uh, descent into war. Nobody really knew. And this is a tension that will remain. I mean, when you look at American policy in the 1990s, Clinton calls it, you know, the policy of democratization and engagement. The question is, at which point do you become uh, an exporter that becomes uh, perceived as aggressive. And that is what happens over the Kosovo War. Um, you know, the Americans do the bombing, the Soviets, the Russians felt they weren't uh, informed. Um, they were really angry about it because up to that point in the Balkans, both sides had cooperated. Um, and you could say, you know, it's the first time that this military force self determination is being supported. And of course, we know what happens after September 11. September 11 is really the big turning point when America acts much more unilaterally, doesn't go with the UN and talks about regime change policies and democratization becomes a sort of real big export, all on this wave of, you know, wherever capitalism uh, takes root, democratization will follow. And it all comes out of this original argument, oh, the end of history, the universalization of all these things. Everybody will want these kinds of values and this kind of system. So the real problem and also the real tensions between the West and Russia emerge in the 2000s. And it has to do, of course, also how Vladimir Putin responds and then also has his own agenda uh, to these changes in the 2000s. But I think September 11 is really the moment where we move out of this. They call it the time that has no name, which was just full of hope that everything is just about when people have prosperity and when they have democracy, we will be a much more peaceful world. And they realize that this is not the case. You can't just export it. That's what the 2000s show. Yeah, that, that struck me. I mean, right at the very end of the book, you're very uh, critical of uh, President Trump. But I, but I was also struck that in some ways um, it, it's a much bigger story, isn't it, that President Obama was already stepping aside from the idea uh, that the United States would lead and shape that world order, the kind of sense of exasperation is there, and then, as you say, you can you can even you can go back to President Bush and that sense of uh, exasperation in a different kind of way with, uh, say, European leaders and so on. So I I just wonder whether you know how much of it is President Trump. How much of it is, is it that it was just inevitable that that conservative managerial approach that you describe would ultimately just run out of steam? Well, one could say that the aspect of the diplomatic toolbox, where you hold onto your alliances and you believe in your alliances and you communicate and um, you have a rational, pragmatic discourse over things, even if you may disagree, and there's no doubt there were tensions after September 11, of course, between uh, continental Europeans and, and, and the United States, unlike Britain, that went with Iraq, uh, went with America to Iraq together. Um, that's absolutely the case, but I think what is entirely different um, under Trump is that there is no willingness to sit at the same table to pragmatically try and develop strategies. Um, you know, there's, there's tweets and there's loud shouting and the opinion can change from one day to another what the president wants to say, but it's not about trying to um, cultivate relationships that matter. So what I'm trying to say is what is really unusual uh, in this end of the Cold War uh, period and the way this exit was uh, moved forward is this willingness to have really intense diplomacy, the willingness on all sides 
to look for common solution. This is also something we would really need now um, over the over the coronavirus uh, pandemic. You would expect much more sort of, of course, we see all these national solutions and everybody is looking a bit what somebody else is doing. But, you know, where is sort of uh, deep trust and communication that needs to be built and that needs to be established and that has gone missing in terms of, you know, you in the 19, in the period I described, 88 to 92, over lots of very, very contentious issues, people would rather pick up the phone and try and exchange views and sort of think, okay, how does it look from your side? What is the way forward? How do we manage this? How do we create some kind of predictability and calculability? Those kind of words seem to have disappeared from the current um, diplomatic toolbox. You also don't seem to have um, real proper uh, application of a speech that really lays out ideas and strategy. And that tool is also not applied in a very uh, well-functioning manner at the t- at this time. So the book is Post Wall, Post Square, Rebuilding the World After 1989. It's written by my guest, Christina Spohr, and published by Yale University Press. Uh, but for now, Christina, congratulations again, and thanks for joining us on the American Interest Podcast. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk to you. So that's it from us this week. Don't forget to check our website, theamericaninterest.com, and to subscribe to the show on your podcast app. The show is produced by Damir Marusik with Sean Keady. Do join us again next time. But for now, this is me, Richard Aldous, saying thanks for listening, be safe, and be well. 